Welcome to Wiretier Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet, independently tested by TrueNet as New Zealand's fastest ISP for home and business fibre internet connections. Call them on 0800 4 speed for $69 unlimited internet per month. Welcome to Party of Fifth Estate, where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Look who's joining us tonight to discuss crime, prison and gangs. New Child Commissioner Judge Andrew Beecroft, sociologist, blogger and gang academic Dr Jared Gilbert, Just Speak director Dr Katie Bruce and prisoner advocate and guest speaker at this weekend's Just Speak Conference, Barney Wikitera, the amazing Barney Wikitera. Looking forward to having a chat with you, sir. Thank you for joining us, panel. And remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts to tonight's show off our watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms. And you can email us, watia5e at watia603am.co.nz. Tonight's guest Twitter commentators are Melanie D, Sparris Palestine, and Karen Foreman Brown. Follow them and join in the debate right now using the hashtag Watia Fifth Estate. Let's get on with the show. As New Zealand faces a prisoner population of 10,000 for the first time in our history, mass incarceration has become a byproduct of private prisons and government departments getting revenue streams from locking New Zealanders up. How has our social policy become so warped by anger and how on earth do we turn it around? Dr. Bruce, we have a If It Bleeds It Leads media who myopically focus on the most extreme cases to whip up anger and fury, which in turn gets manipulated by get tough on crime politicians. How do we break that cycle? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And the only way we can really do it is by having some proper sensible conversations about mass imprisonment. So that's what we're trying to do this weekend, bring people together, let communities have their say about what is it that's leading to this situation and what can we actually do about it. How do you, how do you begin that debate? Yeah, I think it's, it's realising that this situation is not inevitable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy to think that the situation is inevitable when government will just throw money at incarcerating more and more people. When actually, you know, just this week we heard about the Netherlands and they've had to close 19 prisons and they've had a reduction of 27% in their prisoner population in the last four years. And they've got a falling crime rate. You know, mass incarceration is not inevitable. Um, you know, there's much more that we can do. Is it obscene that we are looking at a prison muster of, of people in prison? 10,000. That's that. We've never had that. No, it's obscene. And also we need to remember who it is that we're incarcerating. So if, you know, if we incarcerated Māori at the same rate as we incarcerate Pākehā, then actually we wouldn't have a crisis of mass imprisonment. Does the sensible sentence and trust, in your uh, opinion, add to the debate or only inflame it? I think the important thing to recognise in these debates is that we need to be evidence-informed. Yep. And as a researcher myself, I'm always thinking, well, you know, what does the evidence say? Actually, we've got a lot of evidence in this area, but we don't put it to use. And I think that it's only by drawing on that evidence and also by listening to lived experience. You know, the people that really know about this stuff are the people that have lived through it and been through the system themselves. Mm. And that's why, you know, we want to give a voice to those people too. Barney, with the, with the underfunded uh, addiction programmes, underfunded prisoner services once on release and overzealous parole services, mm. you are left trying to help angry men and women who have been more damaged by their prison experience than when they went in. How do you heal these broken people? <clears throat> um, well, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough um, answer to give because um, at the moment we're just playing how we see it. There's, um, you know, as a prison advocate, like, Fanu get out and then, you know, there's no, there's no consistency, there's no directed um, services that are there to, mm. so at, at the moment what I'm doing is that when I get a Fanu out, like I have to play it how I see it, like what do you need, how can I help you, and most often than not I'm using um, my relationships with other services and other people, not necessarily the organisations themselves, so if I know personally a person in an 
organization they may be able to help. Um, the family that I help, I, I go to them directly. Yep. And it's like it's like a game of footy. We're playing it as a seed, and sometimes that's dangerous. Yep. And yep. it's really difficult for myself and other people in the services that, that I work in, in the area that I work in, are playing it as I said. And I think there's no there's no real preparation in regards to doing it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the moment, I think I can do even my job better. But at the moment, like like you said, we're trying to um, we're trying to help people that are really damaged. And then we get them damaged already. Then how how do we have to? It's really difficult, oh, man. I'm just really, yeah. I, I find it's, it really it's, difficult. No, I mean it's it, it's almost like the experience <clears throat> of prison is so dreadful for some people. Yeah. They walk out of it with almost a, a post trauma situation, mm. and you're having to deal with that yeah. on top of whatever it was that sent them in there in the first place. Mm. It's like. You're trying to put these mangled people together with the tiniest amount of resources, mm. and then society stands around and goes, "Oh well, they just like crime, or <laughs> or, or these these people." It's, 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 it, there's, there seems to be no compassion or empathy with what do we do with these people once we release them. Yeah, yeah. it's really difficult because that's the same attitude that's been held by um, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of the public, a lot of the government agencies have that same sort of attitude. You know, when the guys get out and they're trying to look for homes, jobs, and all those sort of other things that are necessary to remain out, yeah. a lot of these people have those attitudes like, oh, you're a prisoner, you, you, you did that to yourself. You right. Know, you got yourself in this situation and get yeah. yourself out of it. And it's really difficult to, to get a, a family member a house and walk in and say, hey, to the landlord, this guy's a changed man. Can you give him a shot? Of course. Highly likely, unlikely, they won't get a shot. And that's difficult. What do you think is missing in the debate about justice? Well, you're on the, <clears> you're on the, you're on the cold face, my friend. You're <laughs> right there in the front line. What is it that the public needs to know and hear before they start passing judgment? They're, they're your son, they're your neighbour, they're your brother, they're your, your cousin. They're possibly going to be your in-laws. So, you know, I think drawing the conversation closer to the fact that we're a community, then they're, they're not outcasts. They're going to be someone that you may be living to in, Tomorrow, your child might be going to school with their child, so you're going to be highly, you're going to be in contact with them every day. So, I think it's bringing back their community, that heart, that you're my neighbour. I respect you the way I want to be respected, and I think that's what I'm missing. Commissioner Beecroft, we, we we know that the frontal lobes of teenagers are not well developed, and that the brain at that age is wired for risk taking without understanding the consequences. Why can't society accept the biological limitations of teens and instead demand punishment? Why is that happening? Well, you're right. We've been slow to hop on board. The rest of the world has. We're one of the few countries that doesn't include 17-year-olds in our youth justice system. It's utterly consistent with the brain science, as you say. I think that we've now got a great opportunity to include 17-year-olds in the youth justice system, which would go a long way towards that issue that you raised. And in fact, the recent expert report commissioned by Minister Polly recommended that some 18 and 19 year olds should, in certain circumstances, come into the youth court as well on that very point. Right. We're dealing with almost a different species of human being where the brain is still developing and people make dumb, stupid, reckless yes. decisions that can haunt them for life and convict them for life when, in most cases, with good community based interventions, we can get them out of that. I, I, I was on the board. I was on the board of um, Youthline for some time, and talking to young offenders, you know, guys who had screwed up, and you ask them, "What were you thinking in this moment?" And they honestly, they can't tell you. They get that adrenaline rush. The brain's going crazy. It's that flee or fight uh, sort of headspace they get into, and they're, they're not even sure why they reacted in the way that they did. How how can you punish someone, or what good is it punishing someone? Who's not quite? Who, who doesn't have full full control of their faculties? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm still, I'm still a judge, so I believe in accountability. Of course, of course, we all believe that. And it's really, it's a really question of how we hold young people to account. Yeah. And you raise the exact issue that a, that a a modern and a insightful and an informed youth justice system takes into account that very fact. That is why we have a youth justice system. Mm. Today the brain functions differently. That's not to say that kids, kids should escape consequences. Of course not, of course consequences not. imposed in a different way. And that's why in the youth court we try not to charge unless we really, really have to. The police community provide great interventions in the community. We reserve the court for a very small number of offenders. Yep. And we need to say, and this, I need to say this because it's so often misunderstood, some people 
don't think that including 17-year-olds in the youth justice system would be some sort of kumbaya singing Mandy Tangri liberal slap over the wrist with a wet bus ticket. It gives me no pride to say it, but we do send some, very few, 14, 15 and 16-year-olds to prison. So people can be reassured in a realistic way that if 17-year-olds committed the most serious crimes, just as 14 and 15 and 16-year-olds can be, they, there is imprisonment available. But it's a radically different approach and it's a different paradigm. But Community safety is still important, and I have to say that as someone who is a judge. Of course, of course. Look, it's, it, it seems like a large chunk of New Zealanders don't just want punishment in prison. They seem to want suffering. Despite serious crime falling steadily over the last 20 years, why are we so <coughs> counterproductive in our responses to crime? Well, I'll tell you this. When I speak to families and they have a child in the criminal justice system, that's not their response. They long for a system that is nuanced, that, yeah. would, that, would, that, that would promptly respond to their own child's offending in an appropriate way where there is accountability, but also there's hope for the future and there's hope for the young person to get out of a life of crime. So if you boil it down at an individual level, when people know the individual circumstances, the attitude almost always is quite yes. different from that yes. stereotype that you've got there. And I'm yeah. not sure quite what it is in New Zealand. I mean, people say we often get the societies we dream of or deserve, but we are an unusually punitive little country for yes. reasons that I can't quite understand. But yet, if you ask individuals, they say to me, give me that young person, we'll sort them out, we yeah. can help. Yeah. So, so there's a strange juxtaposition going on of sort of a, a hyped up view that we, we're never tough enough and we've got to be tougher, yeah. next to a group of all of us almost, as individuals would say, ah, oh, when we understand the individual circumstance, we can do better, we can intervene, we can ensure a better approach. And I'm not quite sure why that is in New Zealand. Dr Gilbert, we saw the Justice Minister Judith Collins lash out last week at uh, Napari Nui's voluntary work in Whanganui Prison because he had gang affiliations. How short-sighted and stupid is that decision? 1 to 10, 10 being the highest? <laughs> um... Well, look, I, I think we never um, p politics never does well when it debates um, law and order and gangs in particular, I'd argue. Um, they tend to be very, very emotive mm. um, topics. Um, and also they tend to, um, as Judge Beecroft has just pointed out, um, they tend to speak to sort of base elements um, that exist in all of us and certainly are evident within the community where we demand sort of punitive actions and we know right from wrong in very simplistic ways. And unfortunately, um, we saw that uh, this week. And look, it's not the first time that um, that, 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 that he has um, worked with state agencies to intervene in gang disputes. And he's sure as heck not the only gang member who does so. Sure, sure. Um, so it was just a bit of knee-jerk reactionism, which was a bit unfortunate. But look, there are very good reasons, extremely good reasons, actually, why carte blanche gang members shouldn't be allowed access to prisons, oh, like, or working or otherwise. But to suggest that... Um, there aren't individuals who may be able to contribute in a very, very difficult area where I'd argue we need all the help we can. Right. Uh, as, as, I, as I think, um, as I think, short-sighted. What does society not understand about gangs? Oh, look, um, I, I think. Look, society can be divided in this way, um, and, it, and it may well be along um, similar lines of offenders, actually. That if you go into certain communities where gangs exist, where gangs have been for for, for, for generations, huh. um, where they're um, semi-institutionalised um, within communities, you'll find that the people within those communities have very different views on them than um, what we might call, for want of a better, better term, Middle New Zealand, who yep. has absolutely nothing to do with gangs. Now, they are very fearful of them, yeah. and they have a, um, a completely disjointed view of them, bred out of... Um, the very worst media representations, which is exactly um, why they make the media, of course, um, for, 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 for terrible acts. And so the nuance and the grey that exists in these groups um, vanishes um, and everything becomes um, simple. And unfortunately, they're a very complex phenomena. And if we've got simple understandings of them and certainly if we've got simple um, responses to them, then they will defy what you know a complex phenomena that, that gangs certainly are. You get this feeling that there's a percentage of New Zealand society that won't be happy until they're all in orange jumpsuits chained together on the road, breaking rocks, singing Old Man River. Why is it that you think that, 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 that New Zealand is just so angry when it comes to trying to find justice? 
Um, look, I think, um, is New Zealand that angry? Um, look, I think we've been, again, we've been very, very poorly served by politicians and Professor Platt from Victoria University called it penal populism and I, I, mm. I like the term and what it's, what, I think what we had for a very long time is we never had a debate on the rights and wrongs of our approach to corrections. We just had a debate on who could be tougher um, and that mm. got us nowhere. Mm. And, and we, Katie was saying, um, Katie was mentioned earlier, um, or I think you may have asked Katie, Katie, how do we begin this debate? I would argue that the debate's actually already started, and it started with the global financial crisis when, when, when the government realised that they're throwing money away mm. um, on something that simply isn't working. Recidivism rates are incredibly high. Prisons aren't <coughs> solving a thing, and so we need to rethink it. And, and, and in some ways, what we saw from Judith Collins um, this week in relation to gangs was a throwback to those older sort of yeah, times yeah. where she just couldn't help herself really um, to, 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 to enter sort of um, populist politics rather than a, a, a rational and, and dare I say perhaps even slightly braver approach that may see us um, uh, start to bring down the cost, reduce our recidivism rates um, and enjoy a prison population where we ought to be rather than where we are. Dr Bruce, the deplorable deplorable level of Māori men and women incarcerated in prison has been noted by the UN as unacceptable. Do we need a Brown Lives Matter styled radical protest response to force Pākehā to confront the racism of our justice system? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at it this way. As a white woman, I have a chance of about 0.3% of going to prison. And that's in America where they're trying to go for some Guinness World Record for for prison um but actually you know if i was if i was an african-american guy that would be 21 percent and you know we wouldn't be looking too dissimilar over here it's a huge issue and it's one that the government are not facing up to and it's one that we must absolutely must and that's why the same week as the waitangi tribunal case against corrections for the high level of recidivism mm. Um, happens at the end of July. We'll be holding a forum in Wellington talking about exactly that issue about Māori and the just us system. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we really encourage people to to get involved and have their say and to speak up. You've done amazing work, uh, Just Speak, on that. Barney, uh, if someone has served a very long time in prison and we are seeing one of the unintended impacts of the parole changes, are prisoners refusing their guilt so they don't have access to rehabilitation, so they end up serving longer and longer sentences, how much more difficult and costly is it to try and help them move on with their lives after such incredibly long lags? Um, again, you know, that, that leaves a lot of responsibilities for social services to take, mm. you know, take on the, respons you know, the, the responsibility to help, help our whanau out. And it's really difficult because I know a lot of the whanau that do get released aren't in the mindset to actually want to do these programs under their own strength. Mm. Um, probations, you know, forcing them into these programs that they don't want to do. And if they don't do those programs, they get breached. And therefore, they get back, you know, highly likely to get back in, you know, sentenced yep. back to prison. So, you know, it's left us to us to kind of be their mediator to say, hey, you know, sometimes you just got to knuckle down, put your head down and do these programs. And I don't know whether it serves as a learning experience for them or just to put them through further punishment that they don't want to go through. So, you know, it's been a real difficult for, for us to have to cater to the needs of a lot of our whanau getting out who haven't done drug and alcohol or haven't done, done any psych programs, haven't done any parenting programs. So we've had to kind of, like, you know, yeah. juggle ourselves to kind of, like, deal, deal with that for them. And sometimes, you know, um, they're, 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 not, they're not really accepting of it, but sometimes they are. And I think, you know, with the lack of actually the funding for that to happen on the outside, I think that's another issue because... Our whānau can't do that on outside if it's not funded. Of course, of course. Not of course, funded, you know, and, and that's another, another, another issue that we have to look at. That, You're being um, left as the ambulance at the bottom of the yes. cliff with only one band-aid between you. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Commissioner Beecroft, how do we keep young people out of prison? Well, we know that it's a statutory last resort in the youth court, and we do it best by using community-based resources. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I talked, and I'm going on about this, but committed to us thinking through and adopting, including 17-year-olds in the system, one of the huge advantages would be it attacks that issue of Māori disproportionality, mm. because the youth court system is committed to community-based diversionary approaches, and for minor to moderate offenders who are disproportionately Māori, sadly, it is a real way to break the circuit and to avoid that awful phrase, the criminal justice pipeline. 
and I see it as a circuit breaker. Yeah. I think we can also we can also say too, if we're going to address Maori offenders, you say keep them out of prison. For 25 years we've had an act, the Children, Persons and Their Families Act, that has made explicit on its face that all measures for dealing with young offenders have to involve whānau, hapu and iwi. Yeah. And that theme of hapu and iwi involvement of ownership, of fostering the ability for hapu and iwi to to care for their own people, their own whanatahi, that is a theme that has just been so crystal clear in the act. But to our shame, shame on us, it has not been practiced. It's as if those words, hapu and iwi, have been twinked out of the act, to use the old expression. It's as if, it's as if they're not there. We are, we, are, we are changing. I think the country's realising that the best way of dealing with Māori young offenders is to mobilise and use the resources of the marae, yeah. of the wisdom of kamata and queer, yeah. of having iwi and hapu in partnership. <coughs> it's not just words, but they have been words for 25 years, and no one's quite known, it seems to me, what it's meant. Those in the justice system haven't opened the door. Harper and Iwi haven't, in one sense, come through it either. And that's a debate that we have to have. It's what we've been trying to do with our Rangatahi courts, where we take young offenders, mm. Māori offenders, yeah. onto the marae. So that's proved to be... I think we can be cautiously optimistic about that. Right. There's been some real successes there. I tell you, the kids who go to that marae are different in their attitude and yep. their swagger and their demeanour. They are different kids. They're not part of it. Of, they're still part of the justice system, but it's a culturally adapted system. And if only the country could see the changes that take place in mm. those young men in particular. And that, I think, points the way to the underlying solutions, maybe, that you are. That's a long answer, but when you say, how can we do better for young Māori and not have them in prison, what I've talked about hints at the solution. Dr Gilbert, is crime and punishment doomed to forever be a political football, or do you think we can actually make genuine progressive changes? Of course we can. Um, in fact, Judge Beecroft, um, the, 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 the work of the youth court at Naho FR when it was there, I think, had similar um, outcomes, seem, seemingly had very positive outcomes. But the one thing I think we need to um, really keep in mind here, and this is not a, a, a unique statement, I'm not breaking new ground here, mm. is that um, we can um, do all we like um, when the, uh, in the criminal justice system, but what we have to accept is oftentimes by the time people have got there, they're incredibly damaged. And, mm. you know, all you have to do is any type of work in the prisons um, with prisoners and you, 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 you um, uh, hear the back stories of the vast majority of these people. They haven't come from our backgrounds. Yeah. They've come from very different backgrounds. And up until the moment they've offended, they would have been seen as victims. We would have had a great deal of sympathy for them. Sure. We can't expect a person going into jail to be miraculously healed of 20 years of, um, of, of, of abuse. You know, yeah. we simply can't. And so we must, we must keep in mind um, that our activities um, tackling the drivers of crime um, will be our long-term solutions. That is where it exists. Now, that's not easy, and it's not popular potentially, but that's a fact, and if we, we must confront that. Dr. Bruce, you have a Just Speak event in Auckland this weekend. What are you hoping for? Yeah, we're hoping for some real, real solutions coming from communities, hoping for great discussion. We're hoping for, you know, some real honest discussion about how we can do exactly what Dr. Gilbert was saying. How can we stop this pipeline? What can we do when these when these kids are really young to stop that happening? Barney, you're speaking at the Just uh, Speak conference. What are you going to be saying? Uh, just talking about the work that we that I that, that I'm lucky enough to do. Um, I'm also talking about my own experience as a young person being sentenced to nine years in prison. Yeah. Um, along with my younger brother who was 16 at the time, being sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Yeah. I'm um, talking about those experiences and. I, I didn't want to be the token brown guy who had done some done a lag in the room, but I've got some experience, and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it's more positive to share it in a positive way on, on behalf of those who may not want to speak. Yeah, yeah, so yeah absolutely. That's, that's and it's and it's about. that human ex human expression and experience mm. that others can connect to and go, oh, sure, that, you know, that was a pretty yeah. hard, you know. I oh, definitely, but just want to touch it just before we go please, just please. quickly yep. that um the community thing I wanted to talk about in prison, you know, just building on what Judge Beecroft talked about in regards to our iwi and hapu, I mean, it's about breaking down our barriers, breaking down the walls of the prison, and that, that means allowing, or people having the courage to actually go and say, can I volunteer in the prisons? My, I myself am kai whakamana, yeah. so I know the role that Ngāpari Nui play, play down mm -hmm. there, and the role that I'm lucky enough to play. 
um, as as a <coughs> as a kaumatua, um, I don't um, I was lucky enough to be made a kaifakamana because I went through the process of of applying to become a kaifakamana, right. and I and I feel that our community needs to get closer to the prison, and the government needs to allow that to happen for things to change. Commissioner Beecroft increasingly, be it 60% of beneficiaries in debt to wins because of overpayments, Housing New Zealand handing out motel bills to the homeless, or the astounding fact that children in SIFS care are more likely to be abused than if left in the wider society, vulnerable people increasingly see the government agencies they are asked to turn to as part of the problem. What benchmark for success will you measure yourself by after your time as Children's Commissioner? Well, I think my first priority is to be involved in the redesigning of child use and family services. Mm. We call it a different agency. Mm. I'd like to think one benchmark is that we intervene earlier, but not so often, and better. And what is done is a world-class statutory intervention system for care, abuse, and youth offending. I, can just, I just want to endorse what others have said, that when we're talking about these top-end offenders, what's often lost is they are usually the most damaged and disordered humans that we have mm. in our community. There's some tough situations going on. Many have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, neurodevelopmental disorders, and yes, they have victimised others, they have abused others, but almost always they have been abused and victimised themselves yeah. first. 70% of those in the youth court have had prior care and protection notification when they were just children. Wow. So, lost in all this debate, is that we're not just dealing with naughty, silly, reckless teenagers. Yeah. Often we're dealing with hugely damaged teenagers with a constellation of life issues, often not of their own making. And it's very easy to have some plastic solutions. It's tough work, it's challenging work, but we can do it. So I guess I'd like to measure success by a world-class system that was intervening less often, but intervening better so that we had less than 70% of those in the youth court with a care and protection notification. We have to wrap the show. Thank you, uh, 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 Judge. We've got to wrap the show. Uh, final word with our panellists. Uh, let's go to Dr Gilbert. Your final word, please. Um, look, well, my final word would be this, um, that, that all the processes in the world um, can be very, very good, but we need to rely on good people. And so I'd wish um, Judge Beecroft all the best in the world in his new role. I haven't heard a single person that's had a bird, bad word to say about that um, appointment. In fact, on the contrary, everybody's seen it as great. And um, yeah, I think he's got a wonderful opportunity to do great things and I just wish him all the best. Great, great, great words there. Barney, your final word? Um, to everyone, just be courageous, be strong and let's, let's apply the game changer. Dr Bruce? Yeah, I'd say We've got this window of opportunity right now where we can change, raise the age of youth justice. We're really proud to be leading 31 organisations in calling on the government for that change, including Victim Support, UNICEF, Salvation Army, and a whole host of others from across disability, youth and justice. Ju so we've got to do it. Judge Beecroft? We have the opportunity of a lifetime, right time, right place, to make some significant changes. But let us not forget... It's not an issue primarily for the government or it's out there, it starts with us. We have to recapture that sense of shared ownership of community responsibility mm. for all these issues. And it starts there, it starts with our own family and our own lives. And that's the real challenge, I think. Thank you, panel. To my final word, you might think that ACC owning 33% of Circo's private prison at Wirree was obscene enough that a government agency would generate revenue directly from the incarceration of citizens is a recipe for disaster, especially as we near 10,000 New Zealanders in prison for the first time in our history. To do it with a private corporation that has an appalling human rights record, runs brutal detention camps for the Australians and has been corruptly caught out wrongfully invoicing other governments makes this obscenity an abomination. The icing on the cake was Circo having one of their prisons taken off them because of fight club brawls, assaults and standover tactics, but it gets worse. It turns out ACC is working with Circo despite Circo building nuclear weapons, which is a direct breach of ACC's own 2008 investment rules. I can smell the uranium from here. This is how damaged our anger and hate towards crime has warped our social policy. A corrupt corporation who also build nuclear weapons with an appalling human rights abuse record running our prisons for a profit. We urgently, urgently need leadership on this.
Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Fano, for watching our 100th episode. Many thanks to the Watia and Face TV crew who make this happen every weeknight. And many thanks for you tuning in. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7 p.m. for Watia Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Watia Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet. Call them on 0800 4 speed.